Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Vendor Perspectives, Technology, Innovations, and Esports production. I'm Ken Kirschbaumer, SVG Europe and SVG US Editorial Director. Uh, welcome and glad to be joined by four great gentlemen to share their insights on how the uh, you know, production landscape has changed and from a vendor perspective, how they're seeing things from their customers as far as the conversations, how they've been evolving over the past year. Uh, please welcome Charles Conroy, VP of Gaming for the Switch. Hi, Charles. Good to see you. Mo hey, Goyle. glad to be here. Good to see you. And Mo Goyle, Senior Director of International Business Development, Live Media Production for Everts. Mo, how are you? Very good, very good. How are you doing, Kat? Doing all right. Daniel Millward, Esports Unit Manager for Arena. Daniel, good to see you. Hi, thanks for having me, Ken. Excellent. And Peter Wharton, Director of Corporate Strategy for TAG VS. How are you doing, Peter? Hey, Ken. Great to be here. Thanks. Great. So we're going to start with a nice, big, broad question. So Charles, for you, I mean, obviously these past year, we know what's been going on, so I'm not going to mention those words. Um, so how have you seen the esports production landscape and be uh, changing and evolving? And, and how are they utilizing your services differently than they were, say, 13 months ago? Yeah, look, uh, the past year, I think we can all agree, has been one heck of a ride. Um, some some positives and negatives in the esports space are, are one, it proved it was almost pandemic proof from a broadcast perspective because esports was able to soldier on when a lot of pro sports weren't. Uh, by nature, we're virtual. We don't need a physical stadium. Um, so it was great to see esports get some more mainstream attention with outlets like ESPN and, and other large sport, uh, sport outlets. Um, the downside is obviously the lack of live events, right? So how does that change production flow? Um, remote production, I think, is on the, the tip of everyone's tongues for the past couple of years, but this sort of forced the hand for it to be mandatory, um, working in a remote environment. And then obviously cloud-based production um, has been sort of the name of the game for a lot of these online tournaments. Uh, over at the Switch, we were producing the Mimic product prior to COVID, and um, you know the timing just happened to be it was about ready to be released when COVID hit. So we were ready with a cloud-based solution that our, our clients have really loved and utilized. Um, but you know, just in-person production hasn't, hasn't been happening. So people have had to be nimble and adapt. And again, from an esports perspective, great to see the increased viewership and awareness and, uh, really looking forward to getting back to live events and having COVID be a thing of the past. Sure. Sure. So Daniel, from your perspective, cause you're in the trenches at these events, um, with the esports team. So what's, what has it been like this past year? What have, what have you seen as far as the change of energy, um, esports is, you know, pretty much a digital electronic world anyway. So what's it been like out there from the arena perspective? Well, for us, it's been, um, I mean, our, our traditional way of dealing within the esports location was, was pretty much um, dealing with the esports events organizers on site and, and you know, taking their tech, uh, marrying it with our tech, et cetera. But, I mean, during COVID, that's completely changed. That, that even that event manager isn't there and we've become that as well so we've been you know busy negotiating and, and working with the players directly which is something we never done before as a company we were just you know we were receiving the fees from the event organization on site and and that's changed enormously for us and our, our staff have enjoyed really um, engaging with the players and the teams directly whereas that barrier between us and them the event organization was 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 keeping us from that so what's it like been developing that relationship then with the players and because they probably you're new to them as well so is that yeah been interesting? yes developing that with developing relationships with the players has been fun uh we've got a, a you know a, quite a young team of our own um engineers and and they're all gamers and so um that that's been interesting i mean you know onboarding players for events online has been a challenge um, yes. which is something we weren't involved in before. Um, so during COVID, you know, conversations like um, for a player, you know, when will you be back from school um, in order so we can set up your tech at your end? You know, this is, and, you know, that those players have become friends of our engineers. Um, and, you know, during an event, recent events, you know, we'd be rooting for those for certain players based on, the, uh, the rapport we've had with them rather than how wonderful they are as a gamer, you know. So that, that's been extremely fun. Right. Um, and, you know, there's been language barriers, of course, um, with various global te teams, of course, you know. Uh, we've, we've been uh, using translators and that, so to, which is something we've never done before as engineers and as a production team. Uh, Excellent. So that's been good. That's great. So, so Mo, from, from the Everts perspective, 
you know, what have, what have you seen as far as um, when you're talking to the esports clients and customers out there, how they're kind of looking to you for different types of solutions at all? Or Yeah, I think uh, both, both Charles and Dana both highlighted, I guess, the big challenge, which was um, the non-in-person events, right? So that kind of changed, uh, you know, prior to, you know, the events of uh, last year, uh, you know, you would see this increase in larger scale events um, that were, you know, very large scale productions and, and having everyone congregating to different venues and arenas, also a growth in uh, more venues, um, whether it would be in malls and things like that. A lot of that's been in pause. Um, but I think the big thing was how do I continue to provide live events and those challenges, those competitions. Um, and I think one of the the big things that you saw with the group was they were very willing to try different technologies in the cloud. They were, I think, the group that jumped on it fairly quickly. With <laughs> they went zero to hundred almost in in no time. I mean, they were they were on they were on air uh, in weeks uh, using whatever tools were available, stitching together things just to get those competitions up. So I think that was the the scramble in the beginning and sort of echoed what we saw on the broadcast side. But they they did it very quickly and they they put a lot of resources. Uh, I think what's happening now, what we're seeing is how do I make those services now more robust? How do I, how do I improve the quality? Um, the, the whole remote production um, or, you know, maybe it's now distributed production is, is really changed um, how those things are done and acceptance of, I don't need to bring people into venues. I just need to make sure that I take advantage of what network connections are there. How do I bring higher quality video um, from the remote places, remote uh, uh, venues from the players, the commentary, the observers. Uh, how do I get them signals? How do I handle that uh, latency? Uh, and realize that I need to also change how we support them, uh, making sure the tools are very simple. Send the devices, the flight kits to the event or to the players' homes, plug and play. That's what it's got to be. So I think that's been the the sort of um, the change in the conversations we've had. Is it's been how do I make my how do I leverage your technology to create a more robust reliable um, solution to continue to produce these, uh, these events. Sure, sure. So Peter, from your perspective, obviously a tag, um, multi-viewing, I'm guessing that multi-viewers for both real world people the last year and esports, the challenge has been the same, right? As far as we're probably doing deployments at home and what have you. So walk us through sort of what you're seeing out there um, and, and how you kind of responding to the, the changing marketplace. Yeah, so I mean, if, and if you've been paying attention to SVG presentations over last year, you would have heard a lot of this already. So you guys have done a great job exposing this. But obviously, um, there are customers who are moving rapidly to the cloud to enable future workflows where they don't want to build on-premises facilities. We're doing a lot of work to help customers build monitoring at home where, cust where operators can build their own custom work surfaces and stuff. Because one of the things, if you look at it, if you're in a live production control and you had this big, you know, 10 screen monitor wall and everybody shared that same monitor wall and we're looking at different parts of it for their part of the workflow. But when you go to an at home production operator, then no one's going to have a 10 screen at home, right? And no one of those screens from that big monitor wall was the right thing for any one of those operators. So now we have to build individual layouts for every single operator for just the things they need to see. So those are one of the things you start seeing happen. Um, and lately, what we've been seeing is that, um, you know, obviously there's continued move to the cloud and esports people doing very complex layered production workflows and cloud multi-level production workflows. But they're also looking to build these hybrid models. They still want to have, you know, going forward, they're going to have some on-premises or in cloud and want the flexibility of moving back and forth between them. They, they really don't want to be locked into either environment. So pure software built systems are going to be the answer for them to really get to where they want to go. And I would not be surprised if that influences what we see in more traditional production environments down the road. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all kind yeah. of sorts out over the next uh, year or two. Um, so, Charles, I wanted to kind of circle back around with you for our next topic, which is, you know, I want to give a little bit of a primer to people who there are obviously a lot of people who are watching this who, who are obviously involved in esports and understand it. There's other people who just do real sports and say, I don't understand the differences between esports and real sports, as far as from a production standpoint, from an energy standpoint, um, what's your? Can can you kind of give a little bit of the? Is is there a big difference? Do you find? I mean, there's some key differences, obviously, between real sports production, quote unquote, and esports production. Um, what are some of the key differences that you see you know, that you see there when you look at the way they handle their shows differently, other than the esports guys obviously embracing the cloud, I guess, much more quickly. 
Yeah, I mean, to that point, <clears throat> when esports is always broadcast in, in sort of a, a stitched together kind of way, because being a native of the esports industry, we've had to, right? Um, I started in esports in 2003, and the way you would watch a Counter Strike match is you would go in as an observer, control the camera, be able to see the entire game, and then tune in using Winamp to a, a radio station that would be announcing the game, which is kind of an old school, like 1950s way to to quote unquote watch a game, but that's just, that's how we knew how to do it. And that's how we did it. Um, when actually Corey Dunn, who's on the SVG esports board was sort of like the best shoutcaster at the time. And so I would listen to Corey on the radio when my team played. Um, and then we've evolved from there. So esports has sort of always figured stuff out as we've, we've gone along. Um, in that way, we've been innovators. And in that way, we've made a lot of mistakes because we probably weren't doing things the most efficient way. We just did things the way we knew how. Um, and it, hopefully esports is moving beyond that now uh, with, with great companies that are on this panel and, and other companies that are involved in SVG to sort of up the game. Um, but just to, to kind of make that point that, that COVID was one of those things they figured out quickly because esports has always sort of figured stuff out on the fly and, and built the plane as they were flying it. Um, so yeah, to answer your question that was asked before my long tangent, <laughs> Esports uh, production is entirely different than real sports production in, in a lot of ways. Uh, there's not physical boundaries, right, that you're you're tied to like a field. Um, you can take every player's perspective. You can't do that in a live sports match. So you can do a lot more. And, and not to offend anyone who's watching this, but as an esports native, I think it's much more difficult. Um, there's just a lot more angles. Again, it's it, it, again not to offend, but when there's cameras on a field and you just have to point to different parts of the field it's a lot easier than trying to capture every movement that could possibly be made while getting point of views um, and putting that all together for a fan base that is frankly very fickle and has a bs detector that's pretty high so if it's not legit and it's not authentic and you're not capturing the action that they want to see and you don't understand the game you're gonna get called out really quickly um and I have never watched cricket, but I assume that's probably easier to capture the action for. Uh, and that's just a, a general example. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure I'd love cricket, but that's not my field. So, you know, you know, what was the first remote sports event that was done? Carry out, you know, I, I work with NBC in 2006 and we did the Olympics from Turin remotely. But you know what sport it was to go along with cricket? It was curling. I mean, think about something where you you, know, you can just leave a camera on it and not worry about catching the, the fast move, right? You know, right, so, right. That's, totally. so that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so the long answer is esports has it's got a lot going on from a production angle and yeah. a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating to, you know, to watch the, um, the shoutcasters. I don't even know how they do their job because, you know, it's like trying to do, it's trying to tell the story of a baseball game from first camera perspectives. I mean, first person perspectives, it's very difficult because, you know, it's, it's and so that, that whole relationship between the observers and the, and the town is amazing to me. So, Daniel, what's your perspective? As, as I'm, I'm assuming you've done some real world sports where you've kind of yeah. rolled in 55 cameras. And uh, what's, what's the yeah. difference that you see that people should be, understand as far as how uh, they well, approach it di I mean, differently? I I, I do believe that esports is very difficult to cover well, um, more than the traditional sports. I mean, the easiest part about esports, of course, is the weather. Um, <laughs> uh, out, outside a lot in the real sport world, as they say, apart from obviously basketball and indoor sports like that, it, it, there's those challenges. But it, I mean, those mainstream sports are have been covered in the same way in week in, week out for many, many years. Um, the esports, you know, I see the production companies coming to us with innovative ideas. How to, you know, it's constant. That, that you know, you, the casters, for instance, are continuously telling their story and and interacting. Um, whereas the play on on, you know, in definitely in the UK, it, it, the game can be left alone to be watched for long parts of periods, you know, for periods of time. Whereas, and the commentators can take a rest. I think in in the mainstream, we just put cameras anywhere, and and you know they're they're, they're large cameras. They cost a lot. I think you know we the, the tools that we're using in esports now would tend to I can see those being used in mainstream sports. You know, mini cameras, tiny cameras. You know, using iPhones for instance that we we've, we've used in esports just to put a camera somewhere 
we can start using that in mainstream. So I think there are links as well as differences. Um, but um, yeah, it, 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 I, I find esports a challenge because it's so new to me. Um, although it's, I've been doing it now for two years, it's always every esports production is slightly more different, whereas every football production in the mainstream is pretty much the same. Right, right. I know that talking to Peter's point about curling, I think talking with some of the esports people, they kind of chuckle when when people do real sports complain when they have like a field that's 100, you know, 100 meters across or whatever. And they're like, dude, I have a field that's miles across and every athlete can leap, you know, tall buildings <laughs> in a single bound. So how am I supposed to keep track of that? So they always kind of have very little sympathy for people complain about doing a regular football match or what have you. And the so, cameras can fly through walls. and Right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. what's, what, are you, what are you seeing as far as the, um, you know, those differences? I, I think that's, uh, I mean, the points that all of them have brought up have been, uh, are, are kind of re real elements there. I mean, we're talking about multi-layer um, production. Um, we are talking about um, player perspective. Um, you know, that's one of the things about esports that's completely different than what we are. You're getting from the players, the players themselves are involved in the game. They are quite familiar with it. The audience is experts in the game as well they're all participants right so you're, you're really are taking the point of the action from that participant's view whereas you know from traditional sports like you said it's historically been done in certain ways and we've carried forth that it's been how do i tell the the game story versus how am i telling the story from the individual's perspective right that's that's the key difference here um you know it'd be great to see a football match from Messi's point of view right like it, that's that's what we're talking about how he sees the game how he sees those gaps that's what we're talking about and that's so hard to do in real sports but it, it, you like you said as, as Charles pointed out and you know you're, you've got a unlimited like you're, you're not limited by physical space you've got this you know omnidimensional perspective and you've got to capture that and I think that's the big challenge and um, that's that's always been you hear the tales of you know uh, an operator that uh, like just say a simple replay operator that's been doing live sports for you know most of the career trying to jump into an esports environment it's a totally different perspective because you're looking at something totally different you, the story that's being told is a different perspective a different uh, viewpoint um, and I think that's the other side of it is is that the audience is also a big part of this, right? They are game players. They are participants themselves. Um, you know, I would say, for example, if I'm watching a golf uh, tournament, uh, I look at it as, as an amateur golfer, a hacker, let's just be <laughs> honest, a hacker. Um, you know, you watch certain things. You watch, you know, for certain actions or certain things. But, you know, gamer uh, esports is a different level. It's, it's, you know, I'm looking for techniques. I know how, I've seen those actions. I've done that. I'm actually a little bit closer to that player than uh, myself and Tiger, right? So it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like they can always, you know, they can watch the golf. Yeah. You and I can watch real golf and the skills aren't going to apply because our physical limitations are there. But whereas in the gaming world they can watch and actually learn and apply that to their become a better player by watching world-class esports athletes that's yeah. huge right to mo mo and your point like that's why twitch became so big originally yeah people weren't watching other people for entertainment they were watching people to up their game right they wanted to get to that pro level um and then it became a source of entertainment but originally you watch pro players because you wanted to be them and i, I watch tiger as well i'll never be tiger <laughs> Um, and I, I think that's kind of makes esports unique and cool, right? And right, esports, right. you get you get a huge amount of interaction with with the viewer, don't you? I mean, and the casters. I mean, the recent production we were looking at. I mean, you had these very informed casters who play the game, were explaining how the moves are done on the field of play, and and the the fans at home were you know they're taking this on board and they're emulating these moves. Whereas you know I could never do a messy turn or, or, or a Cruyff <laughs> turn, but I can learn the game in the way that my my favorite player games you know and those moves there are moves there that, that the fans at home want to do and the interactivity that the esports production gives um allows that that player that fan to interact and that fan to learn right right excellent we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back uh peter you're gonna be on the clock so when we get back from this break peter you are first up so okay see y'all soon <laughs> 